Hi, it's Michelle from Lab Muffin Beauty Science here, chemistry PhD, skincare nerd, and sunscreen obsessy. I've had a lot of questions about certain sunscreens with unusual claims and what I think about them. So this video is about a couple of them. I'll be talking about what I personally think of the claims that two different products are making. There are a lot more products that other people have suggested that I'll be talking about a bit later, so if you have any suggestions, leave them in the comments. I like to talk to the company first to try to understand how they came up with the reasoning for their claim and then try to compare that to what we know about how sun protection works. I try to keep an open mind about these sunscreen claims because there are a lot of problems with how sunscreens work and there are lots of scientists trying to innovate and come up with solutions for these problems. There are a lot of innovations happening all the time and brands don't make a lot of their information public for competitive or legal reasons. So you can't really assume that something doesn't work just because the public information isn't there. You have to really dig. And it usually is smaller brands that are more innovative. Bigger brands tend to not take a lot of risks, even if there is market demand. We've seen this again and again, where a smaller company does something innovative and proves that it can work, and then larger companies tend to hop on the trend or try to acquire the smaller brand. On the other hand, smaller brands sometimes don't have the expertise or experience to test their claims properly, and they end up making claims that either don't work or aren't allowed by law. So it is a bit of a mixed bag. So here are a couple of brands that a lot of people have asked me about and whether or not I think there is enough evidence to back up their claims. A disclaimer here, these are my opinions. I could be wrong, but I have explained my reasoning here and what tests I think would actually convince me of their claim. If you have reasons to disagree or if there's evidence that I've missed, let me know in the comments. If you like nerding out about the science behind beauty products, click the like, the subscribe and the notification bell so you don't miss any videos. Color Science is a dermatologist's favorite, and their most famous product is their powder sunscreen. Powder sunscreens are really promising. The idea that you could dust a powder over your face and get enough sun protection would be amazing. Reapplying sunscreen over makeup would be a breeze. The problem that everyone points out is that you need a lot of powder on your face to get even protection. But when I was working on my video about reapplying sunscreen over makeup, I noticed that there were actually some powder sunscreens that have really high SPS, and some of them even had water resistance. So the Color Science one is SPF 50 and 80 minutes water resistant. What that means is that for the label test, they applied the powder at two milligrams per square centimeter on the backs of people. The skin can be wet for this test, and then they sat them in a jacuzzi for 80 minutes. And then after they came out of the jacuzzi, they retested that patch of skin with the UV lamp and they found that it was SPF 50. So that is really darn impressive for a powder sunscreen. Clearly the powder can cling onto skin pretty well, but two milligrams per square centimeter of powder is quite a lot. So I was a bit confused by this, so I emailed a bunch of powder sunscreen companies asking them how much powder they would expect people to typically apply and how much protection that powder would be. Most of the brands I contacted gave me a really generic answer, but Color Science actually directed me to some data they submitted to the FDA. This data is publicly available. It was submitted to the FDA for um, inclusion in their sunscreen monograph so that powder sunscreens could be considered an over-the-counter drug. So this data is meant to show that SPF 50 is possible with normal application of a powder sunscreen. It's also meant to show that powder sunscreen is safe because there are some concerns about inhalation. Unfortunately, the data doesn't really convince me that SPF 50 is normally expected for their powder sunscreen. So the main study that works out how much powder consumers typically apply to their face is in attachment two. First, they surveyed 136 customers on how long they typically apply their powder sunscreen for. It was a multiple choice survey with five options. They were 30 to 60 seconds, one to two minutes, two to three minutes, three to four minutes, and greater than four minutes. These are the results they got. They took the shortest time in each bracket and then averaged it all out. And so they got a minimum average application time of 60.4 seconds. Then they collected 10 measurements of how much powder comes out of the tube in 60 seconds. The way they did this is they weighed the tube at the start, then they primed the brush, so this is tapping it and flicking the brush until a puff of powder comes out. Then they got people to apply it for 15 seconds and then reprime the brush and do this repeatedly until they got up to 60 seconds. Then they weighed the tube again at the end and then subtracted it to work out how much powder would come out. On average, this was 0.24 grams. On a 360 square centimeter face, this ended up with 0.65 milligrams per square centimeter. 
So with the SPF water resistance test that I talked about earlier, they actually wiped the powder off people's backs and weighed it after the test, and they found that it was 0.542 milligrams per square centimeter to get an SPF of 52. So based on this comparison, they figured that the average consumer application would get greater than SPF 52. I think there are a lot of problems with this method, which would lead to them overestimating the amount that a consumer would end up with on their face. Firstly, the time that people spent applying powder sunscreen was self-reported, and self-reporting is notoriously unreliable. This is especially the case with timing, we're all just really bad at estimating time. Remember at the start of the pandemic when we all had to start washing our hands for 20 seconds and it turned out to be way longer than anyone expected? Well, because of this, you can sort of expect that these people are probably overestimating how much time they're spending applying. Secondly, the smallest bracket is 30 to 60 seconds. I don't know about you, but when I apply a typical face powder, I take about 5 seconds max. Obviously, if you're applying a powder sunscreen, you're going to try to apply it for longer, but whether or not you're going to apply it for 6 times longer normally is really questionable. 30 seconds is 3 happy birthdays, which is a pretty long time, and a lot of people picked the lowest time bracket. We don't know if people would have picked an even shorter time bracket if that was an option. The other part of the methodology I think also tends to bias towards overestimating how much powder you end up with on your face. Firstly, it's measuring how much powder came out of the tube, not how much ends up on your face. If you've ever applied powder, you know that you end up with a puff of powder around you. Not all of the powder that comes out ends up on your face. Even if it ends up on your face, it doesn't necessarily stay on your skin. There's also the priming of the brush, so they were tapping and flicking the brush every 15 seconds. The instructions for the brush say to tap and prime as necessary, not every 15 seconds. There's also the fact that when you prime it and flick it, there is powder going up into the air and again, not going on your face. There's actually another example of this process in another part of the FDA submission. So this was to establish safety. They had a volunteer apply the powder to her face while they were measuring how much powder was coming out around her face. So the volunteer had experience in using powder sunscreens, she primed the brush, she applied three layers to her face, neck and shoulders, and then they weighed the brush afterwards and they found that she used between 0.06 and 0.18 grams of the product over three trials. So this was a really low amount compared to the 0.24 grams that they estimated with the other method, and that 0.24 grams was only for the face, this was for face, neck and shoulders. This safety study was with an older version of the brush, and Color Science say they've actually changed the brush since then so that it flows better. Even with the new brush though, on the product info page, they estimate that there's a 90 day supply with typical usage. The product is 65 US dollars, so it doesn't seem like that bad a deal. But the brush only has 6 grams of powder, so if you assume that you're only applying it all over your face once a day, and all of the powder ends up on your face, which it won't because you are meant to prime the brush and flick that powder into the air, that only works out to be 0.19 milligrams per square centimetre of application, which is less than half of what they claimed in their SPF protection test. If each application was actually 0.24 grams, like they said in the SPF protection test, then it would only last 25 uses, which is not such a good deal after all. So Color Science doesn't really seem to have a consistent estimate for typical usage, it seems to change depending on which source you're looking at. So the experiment that would convince me is if they got customers to apply the brush on their face like they normally would without looking at the time. Then they could either weigh the brush to see how much powder came out, or even better, they could wipe the powder off the skin like they did in the water resistance test and weigh how much there actually was. I would say getting a UV lamp and testing the SPF would be a better idea, but I don't think people are really willing to get their faces burnt for science. I think it would also be pretty interesting to see what 0.5 milligrams per square centimetre of powder actually looks like on the skin. Color Science also point out that they have really high percentages of titanium dioxide and zinc in their powder, and that you actually end up with more of these active sunscreen ingredients on your face when you apply 0.5 milligrams per square centimetre of powder than if you apply 2 milligrams per square centimetre of a lotion. The problem is that the formula of the lotion is there for a reason. It sticks those active ingredients onto your face a lot better than with the powder. The powder can fall off. It also tends to clump up, and so you don't get even protection as you would with something that's smoother to apply. So overall, I do think that this is one of the best, if not the best, powder sunscreens on the market. The water resistance data is particularly impressive, but I just don't think powder sunscreens work that well at the moment, especially with how people tend to apply them. And the way that the SPF tests are conducted, 
It's particularly unrealistic with powders. Color signs have data showing that people really prefer powders and that people tend to reapply them three times as much as they would with other products. So it would be really great if a powder product did actually work, but I just don't think the evidence is there yet. Another brand that people have been asking me about a lot is Skinnies. Skinnies is a New Zealand brand and they're famous for their claim that you only need a pea-sized amount of their sunscreen to cover your face, neck and ears. Their sunscreen doesn't contain water so their argument is that with a normal sunscreen you need to apply more because that water will evaporate off and you end up with less product on your face whereas with their sunscreen you end up with just the active. So it's like you skip a step in your application process. You don't apply the water so you don't need to apply as much. So here's the specific calculations they do to get that pea size. They use 375 square centimeters as the average male face. From their UVA test, they measured that 1.3 milligrams per square centimeter has an SPF of 78.4. There are studies that have found that on average, the relationship between the amount of sunscreen you apply and the SPF you get is linear. So that means applying 40% of 1.3 milligrams per square centimeter will give you 40% of the SPF. This works out to be 195 milligrams for the 375 square centimeters, which works out to be half a pea. So they double it to be safe. One of the problems with this argument is that not all sunscreens give a linear relationship. So that means if you apply 40% of the required amount, you might not actually get 40% of the SPF, you might get less. The bigger problem is that skin is bumpy. There are valleys in your skin that generally need to be filled in before the hills of your skin get any coverage. So when you apply less sunscreen, you don't just get a thinner layer, you actually get a patchy layer. It's like applying watercolor paint straight out of the tube versus applying it after you've diluted it with water. When you have it with water, you can apply it over a larger surface more evenly. If you have a blob of really thick paint, you can't get even protection over that whole area. So even though you have the same amount of paint, you end up with a very different final product. Again, water is inactive, but it is in the product for a reason. Skin being bumpy is actually why sunscreens are tested at two milligrams per square centimeter. Studies have found that people normally apply less than this, but they still have to test it at two milligrams per square centimeter because that's how much you need for consistent results. The reason for this is probably because of that patchy application. If you have patchy application, it's unevenly patchy and so you end up with inconsistent results. You need to have that two milligrams per square centimeter to fill in the valleys and start covering the hills. With a product like sunscreen, you want to be able to confidently say that most people applying the right amount in an even layer will get the expected SPF, and so unpredictable results just aren't acceptable. It's possible that this particular sunscreen applies really, really evenly, and so you don't have this problem with needing a larger amount, but this would be unusual behavior for a sunscreen. So to support that this unusual behavior actually happens, you would need good evidence. Skinnies have said that they've tried to get the sunscreen tested at lower amounts, but labs have been turning them back because it's not standard protocol. This is a problem with innovative sunscreen products. It can be really hard to test them and it's really frustrating and it sucks. But I think for a claim like this, you do need to test that tiny amount on skin and see what happens and see what happens for a number of people. I do think that the way that sunscreens are tested and regulated can hold back innovation. There are strict rules around what you can and can't claim, and a lot of these things are things that would actually improve the user experience and user safety. But these rules do also protect users from using sunscreens improperly, which is really, really common. I do think skinny sunscreens are really cool and innovative. I've been sent some PR samples and I've tried them and they do feel really spreadable. So I think it is quite possible that a pea size amount could work. But I just don't think they have enough evidence to be able to make this recommendation yet. They do say they have 10 years of user experience and they're trying to get this evidence, but I don't think that's enough. So remember, this is just my opinion about what these companies claim. What do you think? Are there any other products that you want me to look into as well? I hope you liked this video. If you did, you can give it a thumbs up and subscribe. You can also follow me on Instagram at Lab Muffin Beauty Science and check out my blog for more of the science behind beauty products. See you next time to nerd out more.